Thank you very much for giving me the floor. And I'm sorry to take from Professor Negri's uh, very interesting discussion on COVID-19. Um, those of you who may have dialed in to follow discussions on global health may be disappointed. Uh, but I give you two reasons to keep following. <laughs> and the first one um, is that uh, the WHO is actually a small world, and at least my work on the WHO has allowed me to understand many things also about the COVID-19 epidemic. Because at least in my work, the WHO really has a type of you know met working method, um, type of mentality that replicates in all areas of work. And the second one is that although non-communicable diseases, with, which are often, are often called the silent pandemics, um, although obviously they also cause a lot of deaths, but what is even more important is that even in the case of a pandemic such as the one we are witnessing, actually. Um, non-communicable diseases are an increased risk factor and that's quite evident. Well, it's not, uh, we don't have complete studies yet, but this year has seemed to emerge with, if you look at the newspapers, the report that there is a very much higher percentage of people from minorities and disadvantaged populations that are affected by the virus. That being said, now I'll go into the, my, uh, my presentation on uh, um, the framework convention on tobacco control. So, I'm, I'm very sorry. So I just um, three parts. Uh, first, I want to introduce you a bit to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Um, second, I want to, uh, I will explain a bit what is the first part of my research or my thesis about how the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control has been built through what I call uh, strategy and evidence. And then in the third part and concluding part, I will discuss how then this strategy and evidence has played out in the second, in, in the new life of the Primo Convention Tobacco Control, which is the life has taken place since the convention entered into force. So very briefly, the Primo Convention Tobacco Control uh, is actually called, called the first treaty negotiated and adopted under Article 19 of the WHO Constitution. And as many of you may have realized now also from Professor Snegri's uh, presentation, the WHO is usually reluctant to adopt legal instruments, especially hard law legal instruments. So that's actually, it was actually quite a remarkable event in the life. For you, it may seem just, just another treaty, but it was actually a very remarkable, important event in the history of the WHO. And um, the, the, the FCTC establishes very basically some common obligations for parties to adopt tobacco control measures. And it is what, I, what I've shown you here, very simplistic terms of passing from the picture that you can see in your left to the one to the, your right. So we, we have passed actually, if you, if you reflect upon on this, if you have ever done it, uh, we have passed in a few decades from having, you know, advertisement that actively promoted smoking to now having plain packaging and, you know, these very horrible pictures um, on cigarette packages. I've actually chosen one that is not too horrible, but I'm sure all of you have seen the very horrible ones that are around. And this is all part, of course, it would be simplistic to say this is only due to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, but the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control has been, part, has been an important part of this change. Uh, I think it's also very important for the purpose of what I'm going to analyze today uh, to discuss a bit the historical background of the FCT team. Uh, so the FCTC was negotiated in an important historical moment of open war to the tobacco industry, like the, the so-called cigarette papers had just been discovered in which all the lies and all the misfacts of the tobacco industry had been unveiled. And so there was, there was, it was a clear historical moment in which uh, states felt you know, they could go against the interests of the tobacco industry. It's also very important, and this is uh, again another common characteristic of the WHO, that, um, that uh, the treaty has been very much pushed, yes, by civil society, but by a civil society that, at least I find in my thesis, is very much medical in nature. So not only doctors, but also generally healthcare workers or people with a scientific background. And this already, I think, can start giving you an impression of why science is, was so important in the treaty. Uh, but then obviously also like the science is only part, of course, it was also possible by the strong commitment of the WHO Secretary General, Dr. Brantland, who you can see here in the picture. So now we go a bit into the history and what would I call the strategy on evidence. 
So um, I dubbed it strategy and evidence because in trying to understand how this treaty was built, I found that actually many, of course not all, but many of the framing and advocacy strategies put in place by the advocates that I refer to as a tobacco control network were actually very much based on, on evidence. So these people were using evidence to push for stronger and stricter tobacco measures to be embedded in TEDx. And I have many speeches by Dr. Brantland, but also by other people, which say, we have the evidence. This is proved by evidence. Of course, you know, we, you, we have to do it because this is proved there by evidence. And of course, this was possible because by the time, um, just as a reminder, we are now around the year 2000, of course, there was like very solid body of evidence not only on the risks caused by tobacco smoking, uh, but also on how like tobacco, tobacco control could be done. So all these advertising bans on advertisement, um, health, um, health warnings that you, that you have seen at the very beginning. And of course, why also why strategy on evidence was important, because it was exactly one of the grounds on which the tobacco industry had played. So one of the very long-standing tactics of the tobacco industry have been to pay scientists, you know, to try to always say that there was not enough evidence to try to, to higher up the threshold for the good evidence. And this has also again, very, this is a very nice uh, book, Merchants of Doubt, that has been very widely documented. Not, not speculations, but actually there are all, all documents that prove this. Um, so just, you know, very briefly, what I've shown also in my thesis, how this uh, strategy and evidence was used. First of all, uh, they mobilized evidence. So the WHO had accumulated a very solid body of evidence, but also they started cooperating with other actors. And one of the most important actors in this respect was certainly the World Bank, which was mm, kind of asked by the WHO that the nature of this relationship is, um, is a bit unclear, but they, they were kind of asked to publish a report in which they proved uh, how um, the, uh, with, with economic methods, how tobacco control could work and could make countries richer in the long term. Um, and also there were also a lot of other strategies, like for example, I spent a lot of time in my thesis talking about why this framework convention is called an evidence-based treaty, which I think was also part of all these framing strategies and the strategy on evidence more generally. Now I go on to the third part uh, of my presentation. So what happened after the treaty was concluded, because the treaty was concluded in 2003, entered into force in 2005, uh, but it was supposed to be, um, I call it even a regime, but in any case, it's a kind of, it was modeled after many environmental agreements that many people are familiar with. So it has a secretariat and it has a COP, a conference of the parties that meets every two years. And it was all supposed to keep the treaty alive. It's not a treaty that, you know, you conclude the text and you put it aside, but it's a treaty where you want countries to keep discussing and to keep negotiating and to keep advancing the treaty in a way. So what has happened after the treaty has entered into force? Um, the countries have very much continued uh, to discuss, but what I, what I found is that at least in the about first 10 years of the end, since the, the FCTC entered into force, much of the energies of the FCTC parties and, and of the secretariat as well, because there is also a secretariat, has been developed to develop some evidence-based, again, guidelines for the implementation of the FCTC. So to provide, the idea was to provide evidence-based guidance. So, um, whereas the text can tell you, like, you should add health warnings at least, uh, um, I think it has at least 30% uh, uh, in the text of the treaty, and then the guidelines go into depth explaining how they should be done, how, the, how the, this text should be added, you know, even the font, I mean, sometimes they can become quite detailed, it's like they provide some kind of tech, even technical guidance, you could call it, uh, to a certain extent. But the problem that has her roles in this in this context and that are highlighting my thesis that uh, this way of acting of the of the whole tobacco control network which can encompass not only civil society but also to a certain extent the secretariat of the SCTC so all this uh, insisting on the evidence base we have to do what is evidence based provide evidence based guidance and I'm sure if you have connected to a few of the WHO press conferences that have held this in these days on COVID-19, you also hear continuously this evidence-based language. And so if you, um, so what I found in, in, in my thesis is that uh, whereas this, this strategy on evidence has worked very well for concluding the treaties, 
relatively well. Then, of course, you know, we could open a whole discussion, but it has worked relatively well for helping countries concluding the treaties. Actually, in the long term, he has also started having some uh, negative consequences. Most importantly, I'm sure you've all heard that uh, there have there been some new products developed, so like e-cigarettes, um, vaping products, and even ICOS, which is not properly an e-cigarette because it actually contains tobacco. And th these new products have actually started causing a lot of doubts that have divided, in a way, the scientific community, the systemic community, as it's called. Um, and are, people are very much divided whether, you know, the risks that they pose are more or less so that the risks that they could help address. So whether, you know, like, uh, yes, we could, we could encourage vaping, but the problem is that um, is the, vaping still poses some risks. So is it worth to have the risk of having new people vaping when in fact uh, to just lower the risks of those who smoke traditional cigarettes and have them switch to vaping? So this is a bit, you know, in a very, 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 in a nutshell, the debate that is going on. And it's, uh, the problem is that the, what I've found is that lacking totally any kind of um, evidence on what are the long term, uh, long, uh, long term effects, the public health community, including the NGOs, uh, and to a certain extent, you can see even the Secretariat, is completely, um, is not able to provide guidance to state. So whenever you ask, but why don't you have taken any more um, courageous decisions about these products, the typical answer is like, oh, we don't have the evidence. <laughs> and so uh, this has actually made the COP reach an impasse. And whereas, you know, so why I'm saying this, and I just really go to the conclusions, is that, uh, of course, evidence can be a powerful tool to support a negotiation, but it also has, can have, we should, be, we should be very careful not to overly rely on evidence. And what is really important to highlight here is that whereas uh, this may seem obvious, for example, for people who do international environmental law, because that has been, because for a long time in the field, the problem has always been that there was no, uh, so they, they have developed other principles like the proportionality principles and other ways. So, so of course, in other fields, this may seem very obvious, but the problem is that in, um, in an institution like the WHO and the, the FCTC, which is still at least physically part of the WHO, um, this is totally new. They're really not able to deal with, uh, with situations of uncertainty. And of course, this causes some problems. And I, I'll, I'll stay here, I'll conclude on tobacco, but I think it's also impacting the COVID-19. And uh, thank you all very much for, for the attention. <laughs>